studying through the book, um, and, we've been, and the title of the series has been Live Free. And I'm excited this morning because there's good news. Amen. Uh, there's, there's, uh, amen. There's good news. There's good news. And so uh, we're going to turn uh, Galatians chapter 44. I uh, begin the message. Let's pray together. Father, I'm, I'm grateful that there is good news. That Jesus, you are the good news to each one of us, that we can live free. Father, I ask that as we open your word this morning, that your word would speak to us. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are here and that you speak and reveal truth to us. So, Father, I pray that this uh, service would be marked by that. It would be marked by your spirit, that we would receive from you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, so we're in Galatians chapter 4 this morning. Uh, like I said, there's good news. So... Let's read together verse 1 through 7. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1 through 7 says, What I'm saying is this, that as long as an heir is under age, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, their heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time is set by his father. So this, so also, when we are under age, we were in slavery under the element of those spiritual forces of the world. But when this time has fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Papa Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. It's good news. Good news. This morning we want to kind of break break down what Paul is saying to us, and I love how uh, when I read the book, any book written by Paul, right, he does not only does he make these amazing, profound statements, but then he breaks it down with a little argument. And I love this chapter specifically, because not only does he break it down and give a little argument for what he's saying, but then he gives a, an example at the end as a man. It's just like so good. It's like set up my sermon notes perfectly for me. I didn't have to worry about this. Um, but first, we're looking at this, and he's talking a lot about the, in, the inheritance. My, I was speaking a little bit. Feel that? No? Okay. I'll just go on. Okay, so I, he's, talking, <laughs> he's talking about the inheritance here. And what I enjoy about this, when I talk about the good news, is that I begin to realize in Jesus, we have not only an inheritance that we can look forward to, but we also have an inheritance now, an inheritance that we've received from him. So let's look here um, at this really important statement. He says in verse 2, the heirs is subject to the guardian and the trustees until time is set by his father. So that was like, okay, there's, there's a time that's going to be set for the inheritance to come. But what's really neat is when we begin to look at verse 4. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. Is <laughs> that <laughs> really distracting this morning? All right. But uh, so first we're on. God sent his son, born of a woman, born of the law, to redeem those under the law that, that we might receive adoption as sonship. So I was, and when I was first reading this this week, I was thinking about, okay, we could, I could talk and, and uh, talk especially about the salvation that pastor said. We're in a continued salvation. There's a hope of our salvation that we'll receive, that one day we'll be present with the Lord, right? And I said, but as I'm reading this, I was thinking, okay, yes, there's a, a future inheritance that we receive from him. But then I said, wait a second, this, uh, the Paul here, he's talking, he's talking past tense. He's talking about something uh, that has happened already. He said that God sent his unborn born woman. So we know that already we have been, become such and we already have become his sons. And we have been in, engaged with his inheritance. I said, wow, that, that's really neat. What is this inheritance that we've been talking about? Last week we were talking about Abraham and talk about the blessing that he received. So there's four main blessings, four main promises to this inheritance that we received. We're going to go, um, and I got those four marked down. The first one said that they were going to become a great nation. We talked about a great nation being a power, being a, a powerhouse. But secondly, 
that we would be blessed. That God, we would become a great nation, that we would be blessed. So we would, we would prosper. I said, wow, prosperity. I was like, we could be a prosperity gospel this morning. I said, no, that's not where we're going to go. But there's, uh, there's prosper that comes to those who are under the blessing that have received the inheritance. Third is that their name would be great. And I was examining the, the, how his name would be great. There would be influence that Abraham and his descendants would have. Is an inheritance that we have is an influence that we have when we come underneath the sonship of the Father. And then the fourth blessing it was, or the fourth promise was that, that anybody that blesses you will be blessed, and anybody who curses you will be cursed. And it was just, it, as I was looking at this week, I was like, thinking about this. If the Father, when we come under the, um, when we cover the headship of the Father, then we we actually get Father God on our side. I was like, wow, those who bless me will, will be blessed, and those who curse me will be cursed. Like, I actually think that the Father is with me, and, and He's on my side. Like, he, he speaks for me. He, he speaks against me. He's like, He's there on me. I said, wow, the blessing is that those who bless me will be cursed, will be blessed, and those who curse me will be cursed. But God is with us. So we got four promises that we're a great nation, we're, we're going to be powerful, we're going to be blessed, we're going to prosper, that, that our name is going to be great, that we're going to have great influence, and the bless, and those who bless me will be blessed, those who curse me, curse that God's going to be with me, and everything I do is going to be influenced by God Himself. So as I continue to look for, in verse 4, so the, the, this is the promises that we have as sons. We have this promise that those four promises will be evident in our lives. And we're talking about last week, I thought this was an important um, thing to take, is that it's not by right, the works that we do, it's not something that we do in order to receive this, but it's by our faith in the work that Jesus has done that we receive these promises, this blessing. So why is this so important? Let's continue to look here. Um, in, verse, uh, chapter, in verse 6, it says, Because you are his sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit calls out, Abba, Father, so that we are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you his heirs. And this is an important um, statement. And we can look also at others that say that we're co-heirs with Christ. I say, wow, what, what does it mean to be a co-heir with Christ? Something that I was wrestling with the Spirit this week, talk about my equality that I have with Christ, the inheritance that he has, that he says that God says that he's the one that owns all things, that I have that same inheritance. And this is really, uh, I don't know, sometimes when I first when I was first thinking about this, I said, oh, this is like this is, this is tough for me to say that I might somehow have an equal blessing that Jesus does. Like, am I even able to say this, Paul? Are you really like trying to say that, hey, I'm, I'm if I'm an heir to God, I'm an heir with Jesus, that even more so, that when he calls us his sons, this is an important statement. Now, I know um, we were reading, depending on what version you read, I think the NIV, like one time, up, uh, recently updated their version, and so it would include their son, like he would say sons and daughters, and try to make, you know, equal, uh, equal statements and gender neutral kind of language in here. But it's really important when we think about what it means to be a son. Why, why is the son uh, a son um, important in when we're talking about inheritance. Especially when we talk about, okay, what is a what is a firstborn son? So we have multiple examples in scripture that we can look at this morning. I was thinking about uh, the, the inheritance and I was thinking about the uh, prodigal son where he desired to have an inheritance. He went and the other son was upset and he, he hadn't waited for the time to receive it yet. But the son here especially the first person, receives the, the, the main portion of the blessing, the main portion of the inheritance of his father. So for us to be now co-heirs with Christ, to have the same inheritance, this, this, is a, this is a big blessing. But even further so, as I looked at, at um, the blessing that we received here in verse 6, is that the, the Spirit enables us to call out Abba Father. And I've heard, uh, maybe you guys have even heard sermons about Abba Father. And I was looking at, you know, all the different sermons that said, okay, Abba, um, some, uh, some of the people have made Abba to mean Daddy, Daddy Father. And as I was studying this out, though, I said, 
Well, actually, they, they, they say that's not even what Abba means here. This is just an Aramaic, Aramaic word that says Father. So there's a double emphasis here that the Spirit gives to us that, that, we, that through the Spirit, we're able to call Father God our Father. It's like Father, Father. It's like, hey, we're, He is really our Father. And I think sometimes we tend, we tend because we don't understand uh, who God is, like we're talking about that God help us to believe. We don't really understand who He is, but we don't understand what a blessing that is to be able to call God the creator of the universe, the one that owns all things, the one who is the miracle worker, is the one who is a supreme over all things. Like he, we can call Him, God, our Father. That in itself is a profound blessing, is a profound thing that we don't even have to add into the fact that we can call him daddy because we know that he's personal. He's there that he's too close to us. You know, now, like we even say today, the veil is torn and we have access into this holy place. Like, that in itself is a major thing that we can think about, or can, can meditate on, that now we can call Father God our true Father. The one that loves us better than any other human um human father that we have, any earthly father, he's beyond anything, the one that gives us, we give, like, that we can call a father. Now it's awesome also that we have this intimacy with him, right, that we are his children, and, and we can talk about the, the aspects of him in the Old Testament, that he comes and he gathers his, his uh, chicks underneath his wings, like, like a mother hen, right, so we know we have that affection with him, but even so, he is great, and we can call him our father. This is good news. So Paul goes on here in, um, in chapter, in, continuing the chapter in verse 8. And this next part here is really interesting because it shows um, Paul was a man who went and planted churches he, um, and made disciples and he encouraged others and equipped the church and uh, you guys maybe have been in moments, right, where, where somebody who dear to you comes, maybe it's a, a parent, maybe it's somebody, a mentor that you've looked up to, and they come to you and say, hey, you know, I have I have this concern for you. I've been examining this, uh, your life, I've been examining some things, and I have a concern, and I love Paul here, to give a glimpse of this, um, uh, this character that he has, and he's like, hey, I, I, I have a concern for you. I want to I want to point something out to you. There's something been a little off for you. And we all need that in our lives. I was just like we talked about the first chapter where Paul went to the um, church leaders in Jerusalem, and he was like, "Hey, you know, make sure that my, this message that I'm preaching is one that lines up with what, what Jesus has said." Again, here Paul showing concern for his, for the people that he has been teaching. He goes to them. He says, "Guys, I have I have a concern for you." So we're going to look at this concern because I I think it's also a message that Jesus would have us to receive today. So verse eight through eleven, chapter four. As formerly, when you did not know God, you were slave to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak, miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. Stern words from, from Paul. You're observing special days. You're observing, observing the law. We talked about the importance here that when we talk about the gospel, the good news is that we don't have to lean on our own, the things that we do. The law was that I, the things that I do would earn me position with the Father. However, now it's not what I have done to earn me position with the Father, it's what Jesus has done. So I lean on what He has done. In order to receive the blessing, the promises that we that that was just spoken about, but so now he says, you guys, you, you have actually you've gone backwards. You once you started with faith, but now you're observing all of these things. You're observing the calendar days. You're, you're observing things. You're observing what he calls what Paul really straightforwardly calls weak and miserable forces. Wow. Okay. So as I was as I was thinking about this, I um, was talking was researching and talking about the not only so sorry in context we can talk about 
okay, the difference between the Jews and the Gentile and the uh, observing of the law that the Jews are saying. And I said, most people that are in our audience today, I said, they're not worried about uh, following Jewish um, tradition and calendar, or I've put on here even, you know, horoscopes talking about, um, talking about moons and other, other things of that nature. I said, but, but what is it, how is it that we can also relate to this scripture where Paul was talking about they were, they were leaning on weak and miserable forces? And there's a, this same correlation when we talk about the difference between uh, believing in faith and the works that earn us the righteousness. That believing in faith is something of the spirit. And then the works of righteousness, we would say, would be things of the flesh. That I do these things in order to earn the righteousness. I said, what are, what are some ways of the flesh for those who are, um, what are some ways of the flesh? And I was thinking about the, sin, the sins of the flesh, the desires of our flesh, the, the weaknesses of our flesh and our personhood. As we were going through the field guide, um, you guys have, I think everybody has made it through uh, week one of the saturated field guide. But the, in, the, in the saturated field guide, one of, the, one of the, the days last week was talking about different things that we lean on in order to receive uh, receive from God, or other things that we use in place of God, and I was like, "Wow, talk about works of the flesh, talk about weak things." Uh, even in there, I was convicted of one of them was logic, and I said, "You know, I'm a. You know, I went off to college. I I think I can I can figure out some things. I have some good logic uh, logical skills to, to figure out what what steps I need to take and solve problems." I was telling, telling my girls, like, I, I love solving problems. Like, that's like what I love, to, I, I enjoy doing that. But as I was reading this, the Holy Spirit convicted me that I was, it, by my logic, I was leaning on weak and miserable forces. I was leaning on my own forces rather than the Spirit. What's available to me now as a son of God is the Holy Spirit. So when I go and I make decisions, I'm not just making decisions on what, what I find most wise and, and most logical, but no, I, I lean on the Spirit, that the Spirit would give me direction for the day and the situation that I'm in. And I said, I said, whoa, Holy Spirit, that I like felt conviction of the Holy Spirit. I said, wow, now even in my, even what I find good for me to do, I, I need to remind myself that it's not my own things that I'm doing, but I'm leaning on the Spirit in order to do these things through me. Does that make sense this morning? So we find these things so many, sometimes are often are what good and, and praiseworthy things in our life in the standards of the world. And the, right here, what it says is um, that you have turned back to the weak and visible forces of the world, of the flesh, of these things that I work these things to do. But he says in the verse 11, I fear that somehow I have wasted my effort. <coughs> have I not preached to you that you, you walk by faith, you live by faith, and now you're going back to these things? that are works of the flesh? The concern goes on and it gets even deeper. Verse 12 through 16. I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even through my illness was a child to you. You did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I not become your enemy by telling you the truth? There's a um, when I can go in order. I want to. I'll wait. Sixteen. Follow up. He says, "I put with your brothers and sisters. Welcome. Uh, become like me, for I became like you, and did me no wrong." So one of one of the marks of Paul is we talk about even our identity as missionaries. He said that we're a family of served missionaries because the Holy Spirit is in us, and He sends us to speak truth to others. One of the um, I don't know prime markings or markings of, of Paul's missionary journeys is that he became all things to all people. Uh, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 9,
1 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're in verse 19 through 23. We're talking about the, the freedom. What, what is this freedom that we have? Uh, we're talking about the Live Free series. This is what Paul says in um, chapter 9, verse 19 of 1 Corinthians. He says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like the Jews to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like the one not having the law, though I am free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to, the, uh, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by po all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. And Paul first uh, uh, talking to them about this concern that he had. That when I came to you, I came to you, and I, I became like you. I, I did this in order that in in uh, for Corinthians, they, we, he did this in order that they may receive the gospel, that they may receive freedom. He said, and now though I have a concern that I preach to you freedom. In verse sixteen, this was one of the one that was uh, that always gets me when I read it. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Have I become your enemy by telling you of your freedom? Have I now become your enemy? So prior, to, in the in the previous verse we read, they they he had preached the gospel, he had preached freedom, and now they they've gone back and reverted to um, practice of calendars, weak and miserable things. And he says here in verse twelve and sixteen even further, he says, "I came to you, and I came to you. I preached the gospel of freedom to you." And I preached it so that you would receive the gospel and you would receive Christ. But now I see that now that I've preached freedom, you've used your freedom wrongly. Actually, don't you, you got it wrong? Have I preached you? Have I if I told you the truth and now become your enemy because now you're off sinning, you're off and practicing these things of the flesh, you're off doing your own thing? Have I have I become your enemy now because I have preached to you the truth of your freedom, the gospel? Sometimes the most humbling thing when I'm talking when we're talking about discipleship, and we said, "Hey, we want to create a discipleship culture where not only is it the ministers of the church that are sharing their faith with others and um, ministering Jesus and making disciples." It, part of the, the humbling thing when I'm talking about making disciples and sharing my faith with others, because I, I want to be cautious. Like, hey, the truths that I share to somebody, I know they have in, impact enough to change their whole life. And I humbly take those words to you and I say, hey, here's what the Lord has revealed. Here's the truth of His Word. And I want to, sometimes my spirit is like, wow, I, God, I pray that with what, what I have said, they have taken it and they, have, they apply it to their lives rightly because I know that there's weight on it. There's, that I could become an enemy of their soul because once they receive that, once they hear that, then they become responsible for that. Verse 17 through 20. Paul's main concern when talking to the Galatian church was that uh, they had been people that came and began to teach to them things that were contrary to the gospel of freedom. And so verse 17, he addresses this directly. He says, those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. There's times in our, our life sometimes when uh, people with good teaching and good preaching, they have they have zeal for what you believe, right? Like when I, I believe the gospel, I'm like, I'm all for it. There's people that bring another gospel, another way, another freedom, and more uh, more grace than is necessary, but they come with zeal, and we have to be careful. This is why we talk about the, the Spirit of God is so important to us, because the Spirit of God is the Spirit of discernment, and He also is the Spirit of truth. And so even when people come with great zeal and great passion for what they have uh, what they have to teach and what they have to offer, we have to be people of the Spirit that discern what is it, what is the truth. We want to make sure that the truth lines up with the gospel. 
And the important thing is that we have the Spirit of God that teaches those things. And we also have um, elders in the church that are also able to speak into our lives. This, this refers not only to traditions of men, traditions that we talked about here, the, the Jewish traditions that we're creeping in, but it also refers to the, the things of the flesh, things of sin. So that's why it's important that we have the Spirit of God in us, that He convicts us and, and convicts us of the sins that we're in, but also we have a body of Christ around us that can speak into our lives, because there's some that come with zeal that lead us astray. Verse 18, It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. So don't just get, you know, we talk about uh, some good, you know, go, go, into, go to a conference. Anybody ever been to an awesome conference? You, you experience a good word from God, have some amazing worship, and you get really excited, and, and, and you go back, and it's, it's good. You know, you, Paul is saying it's good when you, even when I come, and you get really excited about it. But make sure that, that your zeal continues. My dear children, for who I am again in the pains of childhood until Christ is formed in you. How I wish that I could be with you and now change my tone because I am perplexed about you. There's a desire, I think, Pastor and I, no, I know our Pastor and I, that Christ would be formed in me. Paul's desire was that for the Galatians, for the church that they my desire, our desire is that Christ would be formed in me, that you would lean upon him, that when we think, when we think about that uh, God made my heart believe, that it that really becomes, that Jesus is the only comfort, that he is the best comfort, that he is everything for us. Our desire is for that we pray, we labor over that, that, that Christ would be formed in you, that you would live such a life of faith on him, that nothing else in this world would shake you and shatter you. And Paul says here, and this last statement again gives me, he says, I am perplexed. I'm perplexed that the inheritance that you received through faith in Jesus, now you are leaning back on the works of the flesh to go and to receive from God what the, the promises that were given to you through faith in His Son, Jesus. I thought, why would you do that? Why would you lean on your works again? Why would you go back to those miserable, weak things? Why would you do that? It doesn't make sense. And as I was thinking this morning about the, the faith that we, we, we put our faith in Jesus, it's, it's so free because it's not dependent on what I do. Now, I could lean myself, I could again lean myself on these things of the flesh. I could go after sin. And when I go after sin, then I put myself, I, I put myself back under the law. The, con the condemnation that the law brings is because I break the law. It informs me of how much I am unlike Christ Jesus. But the grace, of, the grace of the Father is that Jesus has done the perfect law, and so now I put my faith in what He has done, and so my uh, constant of the things that I do in the flesh is not for myself, but it's because I live in Christ. I live in what He's done, and now I receive the blessings, of, the blessings of the promise, the great name, the, the blessings of, of great fame, the power. I receive that because it has been done for me, and now I place it on myself. Not because of what I've done. Paul's request. And he continues here in this analogy. This is, really, uh, this is a really profound analogy. Because on the surface, we can look at the, 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 the two children that were born, and we can, and we can say there's a, the, especially the, the Jewish analogy here that we have in, in Sarah and the blessing in here. And Hagar, and we would never, I think, in surface reading of this, we would never put ourselves in the shoes of, of Hagar's, uh, Hagar's son. We would never do that. But as we look a little deeper, we find ourselves that there's, there's a more complex things going on here. Let's look in verse 21. We're going to read um, Galatians 4, 21 through 31. After he's feeling a bit much, why do you keep on going back? He says this. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman 
was born as a result of divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from the Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for the Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But their Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you have never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who are never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of those who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of the promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born to the power of the spirit. It is the same now. But what does scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance. With the free woman's son, therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Would, those who curse us would, would be cursed 
we can't receive these promises on our own. This is only the work of the Spirit in our life. And we know as we follow Him, as we follow after faith, these things are produced in us. The character of God, then, it floods who we are, and it produces in, in us influence. How many of you guys in the room have said, man, when I'm in my workplace, the character of God is so well influenced my life that now, man, I'm getting promotions. I shouldn't get promotions where I'm doing this, and I'm, I've got favor with my neighbors. I got, there's things. I, there, I'm prospering. I'm influenced. I'm speaking to people I shouldn't speak to. I mean, that was a, if you look at the early disciples, they began to speak to people they are just unschooled, ordinary people. What, what was the difference between them and anybody else? What is the difference between us? Because we have put our faith in Jesus. Now Jesus is the character of God, influence in our life, and we receive the blessing of the promises. Now, but then there's also the inheritance that we look forward to. So how does this encourage me? That Paul, you're really hard on these people. It was important that they get it right. Because they knew if they didn't, if they, if, if they went back to the works of the flesh, then they received the work of the flesh. But if they remain in the faith in Jesus Christ, then they receive the character of the Father. They receive all of the inheritance. They receive all of who He is now and what that we hope for. So it's encouraged me two ways. One, it, one, it encouraged me to stay in the Spirit. To meditate on the greatness of the gift that I've received through His Son, Jesus Christ. That I have now become a son. Or even if you're a daughter this morning, that you have now the position of sonship in the kingdom of God. You have an inheritance of truth. To receive all that God has for you. I'm encouraged to meditate on what I've received I don't want any work of my flesh to interrupt what I receive only from you. And second, first I'm, I'm encouraged this by faith. Get as much as Jesus as I can. Secondly, I'm encouraged to to lean on weak and miserable things? How about begin to lean on the flesh? How have I treated my inheritance? I talked this this week, I thought about getting garbage, but I the garbage was already taken out. I'm getting a heap pile of garbage here, and then and then wrapping some great presents on this side. And there's a, there's a have I, by leaning on my own flesh, by, by following certain rhythms, uh, by leaning on my own logic, by whatever it is, Things you say, think operation of the flesh, not of the spirit, not born of the spirit, but of the, fle of the flesh. Have I lost my inheritance? Have I tainted my inheritance? Have I, am, I, am I losing grip of what the Father has provided through me through His Son? And so this morning, I want to invite us to take that moment to examine where we are. I love Paul because he speaks straightforward to me. And the Spirit of God, by His Spirit, also speaks straightforward to me. So that's the opportunity we have this morning to pray and to ask Holy Spirit, show me, where in my life have I leaned on my own flesh? Have I leaned on miserable things other than your spirit? Where have I compromised in the promise that you have given me as an inheritance as your son? Let's bow our heads this morning.